Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Fish and Richardson's Patent Portfolio Management Webinar, where we'll be talking about navigation strategies and due diligence for startups. My name is Caleb Bates, and today my colleague Anita Michael John and I will be discussing issues related to patent due diligence. Our biographies, this presentation, and the New York, New Jersey blank CLE form are all available for download on your control panel. Please note that you must be logged into the webinar on your device in order to receive CLE credit. You will not receive credit for listening to the audio portion only. This webinar will run for an hour, and it does include a Q&A period at the end of the program, uh, but feel free to ask questions at any time throughout the program in the Q&A section of your control panel. We'll do our best to answer these questions either during the presentation or at the end, time permitting. Uh, please also feel free to contact us personally after the webinar. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to briefly mention our next upcoming program in this webinar series. Uh, it will take place a week from today on Wednesday, July 20th, uh, where our colleagues Kelly Del Dato and Willem Atwell will be hosting a webinar uh, titled Exploring Common Pitfalls of Privilege. Uh, they'll guide you through some common pitfalls of pri privilege that companies fall into and how to avoid them. And then finally, uh, just a reminder that the content of this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of Fish and Richardson and is also not intended to address every court case or situation. So if we could go to the next slide. Perfect. Uh, so our agenda today, uh, just to ensure everyone is starting from, from generally the same place, we'll talk briefly about um, you know, what is due diligence and what is IP? So what do we mean when we say IP diligence? We'll talk a bit about the timing and scope of patent filings and how that relates to due diligence, uh, how companies, particularly startups, can be diligence ready, um, and how you can build a team that creates IP value. And finally, uh, we'll address some common diligence mistakes and how to avoid them. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, one more. Thank you. So to ensure we're, we're all on the same page here, uh, what do we mean when we say due diligence? So what we mean is, is essentially a comprehensive appraisal of a business that's undertaken by a prospective buyer or investor, especially to establish its, its assets and liabilities and evaluate its commercial potential. Uh, so when, when we talk about IP diligence, it's essentially a review of a company's intellectual properties and related policies and agreements. Uh, next slide. So what should you expect in IP diligence? Well, no two diligences are the same, of course, but there are common themes that we'll touch on throughout this webinar, some of which are listed here. So for example, determining the business goals and risk tolerance. So what information should a, a potential target company share and what information is a potential partner willing to see? And it's important up front to be clear and direct about expectations. Um, we'll talk a bit about identifying the team, uh, the ownership review of the target's patents and applications, as well as a substantive review, strategies with respect to third-party patents, and then ultimately the go or no-go decision uh, with respect to the diligence, whether that's partnering, acquisition, licensing, et cetera. Um, and then following that decision, strategies following the close to address potential weaknesses identified during the diligence. So an important caveat to all of this, just to remember, is that, that while IP is important, it's not the whole story. Uh, so with that, we can go to the next slide. So before we dig into the mechanics of of IP diligence, let's talk a little bit about what kinds of intellectual property we're referring to. Uh, so IP includes various things, inventions, literary and artistic works, symbols, names, images, and designs used in commerce. So all of these different types of IP that are listed on this slide can be the subject of due diligence. Um, We'll be primarily drawing on our experience in patent diligence for this presentation, uh, but certainly even uh, patent diligence can also rope in other types of IP, particularly trade secrets, which protect confidential uh, information. And once it's public, there's no protection. So just very briefly, 
when we're talking about patents, of course, that's protecting inventions, uh, where you get a temporary monopoly in exchange for a public disclosure of the invention. Copyrights protect written or recorded expressive content, and then trademark, trademarks protect words, symbols, logos, uh, and other designs and slogans that distinguish products and services. It's essentially brand protection. So those are those are the different types of IP we're referring to when we, we, we talk about IP diligence. So speaking of patents then, what exactly is a patent? So I mentioned that uh, on the next slide here, uh, a patent is uh, a grant from the government of the right to prevent others from making, using, offering to sell, selling, or importing the inventions claimed in the patent. Patents can be bought, sold, licensed, bequeathed, mortgaged, and assigned, and they're only for a limited term. So by, by disclosing what your invention is and how to use it, you get 20 years of exclusivity for a utility or plant patent and 14 years for a design patent. And importantly, patents are territorial. There isn't a single worldwide patent where you can obtain coverage in every country. You, you have to uh, file for and obtain a patent in every country where you want protection. And this is really, you know, choose your own adventure in terms of coverage. So what's the technology, what markets are important, and what's the cost sensitivity uh, to filing in these different jurisdictions? So if we could go to the next slide. So why would you get a patent? Well, we're talking about IP diligence, so you can already imagine that, that these questions come up when a potential investor is inv interested in investing in your company or perhaps acquiring some of your technology or licensing it. Um, so, so part of why you would get a patent is to build the business, to gain entry to market. Uh, when patents publish, it can be good PR for a new or a young company. And, and as I mentioned, to increase attractiveness for investment and sale, um, IP truly is of paramount importance in these types of investment partnering and acquisition decisions and is foundational to long-term success. Uh, there are other reasons to get a patent. So for example, to use against others. Uh, I mentioned it was a right to exclude, so you can exclude competitors from the market or use it as a bargaining chip uh, to exchange with other companies uh, in order to use some of their intellectual property. And then, of course, you can also generate revenue that way by, by way of royalty payments. And finally, uh, to protect yourself in the future. So being able to tell your invention story, uh, how did you come uh, come to the innovation that's, that's described and, and covered in your patent when you were later sued for patent infringement by a third party? Um, and, and this also uh, relates to defensive filing. So published patent application, published patent applications can serve as a defense uh, by creating prior art for competitors. So these are just some of the considerations that go into formulating a company's patent strategy. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. So the patent strategy is important, uh, just generally, of course, for the business. Um, but but why why do we care about the proper timing of patent filings when we think about due diligence? Well, this is because patent lifecycle management is not just a patent function, but it's an important part of the larger business plan, whether that includes partnering, exit, or commercialization. So to be an attractive target in diligence, so for these types of funding or partnering events, there should be an IP strategy in place at least because demonstrating a thoughtful approach to protecting your IP assets early uh, garners much goodwill during diligence if minor issues crop up. Uh, it, it essentially shows that, that you've thought through potential issues and, and developed a strategy that you're executing. Um, questions about timing of filings do often come up during diligence and a reasonable answer even if it's not what the other party would have done precisely, can go a long way in giving comfort that there was a strategy in place. Uh, so patent life cycles can span 25 years or more. And so, so some questions to consider when formulating the, the timing approach is, for example, is there a regulatory framework for your product? Um, this can impact both the potential value of the patents as well as the number of patents that might be required to effectively protect a given asset. Uh, and this can also vary significantly 
uh, by technology area. So for example, a single patent covering a small molecule drug uh, to dozens of dozens or patents or more uh, covering a particular device. Um, you also have to take into account things like product life cycle. Um, this can vary significantly between industry sectors and patent value can change accordingly. Again, say a, a software as a service type patent versus uh, you know, a therapeutic antibody. Uh, and so the approach really has to be tailored to the technology, the market, as well as the industry. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. So what are some more specific considerations for patent filing? So, so first is just understanding how protecting a particular innovation can add value to the business. So for example, is a patent the appropriate type of intellectual property for a particular innovation? Um, so if you've got a, a technical innovation, perhaps it's more valuable actually kept it, uh, as a trade secret rather than uh, put in a patent application that will ultimately publish and, and tell you know, everyone uh, what you're doing. Um, what is the business plan for using the patent portfolio and what are the competitive threats here? Um, part of this is, is managing preconceived notions regarding when to file. There is no one size fits all strategy that works every time for every company. It's, it's really a case by case considerations of, of these various issues. Um, so when we think about early patent filings for a startup, one of the things that we, we have to look at are prior art issues and getting scooped. That of course is, is a, a great fear at every startup is, is getting beaten to the punch by a competitor. So how competitive is the space? Um, if if it's, you're working in a very crowded area, uh, that generally favors filing earlier rather than later. Uh, was there a public disclosure or prior sale where now you're already on a clock where you have a limited time where you can still file a patent application? Or if there's an upcoming and unavoidable public disclosure? Uh, you're going to need to, to beat to file an application before that disclosure. Um, so conversely, what has been done? What do you have in hand right now and what can you do over the next 12 months in terms of patent filing? So if you have purely an idea, uh, but really no substantive work has been done, there hasn't been any reduction to practice, maybe it's too early to file. Or if you, you have an idea and you've done a, you know, a very small amount of work, uh, thinking in maybe a life sciences context, you, know, you have a couple of compounds that you've made or an, or an antibody or two, um, but they haven't really been tested yet. You know, what does the timeline look like? Does it make sense to file or is it too early? Um, and then, of course, there's there's always other other pressures that, that may be external. So uh, external to, to sort of the, the, the research and development. So um, investors and founders may have certain ideas about uh, when the, when is the right time to file. And there's there's almost always a push to raise the company profile by publications. Now, whether that's uh, in, in a peer reviewed journal or or via publishing patent applications that publish. Um, you know, both can create uh, create issues uh, with respect to filing potentially too early. And, and as I mentioned, there, there's no magic date here. So applications don't publish for 18 months. So um, even if you think you're in completely clear white space uh, without competitors, um, there are there could be other other companies working in, in the area and you just you won't know until those applications publish. Next slide. So we've talked a little bit about considerations for timing. What about the scope of a patent application? So how much do you disclose? So at a minimum, you have to enable one skilled in the art to make and use the invention. Uh, so essentially you must prove you did what you said you did. Uh, and it's important here to be credible. Tell your story. Um, sometimes we see a, a push to uh, in the in the early filings, a push to uh, include every possible uh, embodiment or or modification of an invention that you could you could ever imagine. Um, so it's a, you know the the invention is a new wrist brace, and we're adding adding things about being able to fly using this wrist brace. You know just every everything under the sun that you can imagine. Well, as a first point that's not particularly credible, right? That's not what you invented. You invented this specific technology. 
Um, and so, so one issue there is when others are reviewing your applications, it seems a little bit less credible if you have pages and pages and pages of these um, sort of unrealistic, unrelated disclosures. Um, the other issue there is prior arting yourself. Uh, which is, is a term I imagine most of you have heard before. So when your early applications disclose, again, just dozens and dozens of pages of, of uh, different uh, modifications to the, the actual invention, um, you might run into issues later if you do, in fact, then make some of those modifications later and want to try and go back and get a patent. So um, one of the unfair feeling tenets of, of patent law is that your application must be enabling the issue as a patent. That's the first point on this slide. But prior art disclosures, even your own earlier work, are assumed to be enabled for purposes of rejecting a pending application. So in other words, it's very easy for an examiner to take one of your early applications with, with all this extra disclosure and use it later to reject uh, one of your, your applications on a modification. Uh, so, so again, be credible and tell your invention story. Um, think also about the scope of protecting specific assets versus protecting platform technology. So generally, the scope of filings for platform applications tend to be uh, much broader. There's, there's a, a bit more um, creativity required often in platform applications because you do have to consider not just what problem are you solving with the platform, but what types of problems could others use your platform to solve? Um, so that, that's one threshold question, but, but another key question with platform technologies is how to detect infringement. So if it's a platform that's used to make a product, are you able to tell based on some characteristic of the, of the product that will be in the market uh, that the platform was in fact used to make the product? So essentially internal versus external use. That, that that can be challenging with, with platform applications. So then on the next slide, we have one additional note on the scope of filing. So we've talked a little bit about um, how much data or prototypes uh, or information you have in hand uh, when getting ready to file, some of the external pressures uh, when getting ready to file and, and internal to a company pressures. What about searching? So searching uh, is used to further inform you of, of what the patent landscape or the prior art landscape looks like. Uh, so performing a freedom to operate or patentability search before filing is not required. Now it's not required by a patent office and it's not required um, typically by investors or potential partners, um, but you will be asked the question in diligence. Um, more crowded space generally favors searching early. Uh, so you can imagine uh, being in a situation where uh, you didn't search and then uh, a significant amount of, of resources were expended on a particular program. You wind up doing some searching later only to discover that someone else is working in a very similar area that's going to make it very difficult for you to get any sort of intellectual property out of your program. Um, so you don't, you don't want to end up in that situation. So uh, we we always recommend uh, to to do do searching early and often, um, as this may impact, of course, the scope and or the timing of filing. So again, a, a crowded area may favor filing earlier. And in terms of scope, uh, you know, it's important to understand the landscape, uh, the patent landscape. Uh, out there to try and navigate that and, and get some some good filings in in the white space, um, but don't assume that you're entitled to market and sell your product just because you own a patent or maintain a trade secret related to the product. So of course a patent is a right to exclude. So others could still have patents that potentially cover uh, what you're interested in. So again, you want to evaluate this early and continue to monitor it, and make sure that you budget both time and money to identify competitor patents that may impact your ability to sell your product. Uh, so again, Anita will talk a little bit more about this, but uh, you will be asked these types of questions uh, during diligence. And then uh, on the next slide, just very briefly, 
uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about budget. So I mentioned budgeting time and money to identify competitor patents. Uh, you know, that, that goes also for, for things like drafting and filing uh, of patent applications. So initially, you know, there's, there's no perfect way to balance expenses for patent filings versus research and development. Um, filing the initial applications may be an easier call. This decision making typically gets more challenging as the company matures because you have uh, more programs potentially that are generating uh, innovation for, for IP protection, uh, just more employees, more contracts, more, more issues are arising, the costs tend to go up. And so thinking longer term, patent expenses at, at what we call the national phase, uh, where you're filing multiple foreign applications, that often aligns when a startup is two to three years in development. Um, and so the, the in-house counsel is, is often asked whether the company should put money into, into patents or into R&D, uh, both of which may be critical milestones uh, for the company. And so, so who ultimately who ultimately wins there. Uh, so that, that can be uh, a significant balancing act, but it's good to consider both initially and longer term uh, expenses as early as you can. If we could go to the next slide. And uh, oh. I'll turn it to my colleague, Anita. Hi, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, my name is Anita Michael John, and I'm going to be talking about how to be diligence ready. And here I'm really um, focusing on how a startup company can be diligence ready. Um, Caleb gave you a high level review of what diligence can entail, and he noted that no two diligence are alike, and he's completely correct about that. And so I'm going to first talk a little bit about the broad types of diligence um, that might be done um, on a startup company. So if we could go to the next slide. So one type of diligence and the first type that a startup company might face is diligence by um, a venture capital firm or other investor. Um, at some point, you might undergo a diligence because someone is considering licensing some of your technology, acquiring some of your assets. Um, and then for many startups, um, there's a liquidity event and there's gonna be an acquisition or a merger and diligence is done at that stage too. And so when you're preparing yourself for diligence, you need to ask yourself, of course, well, what type of diligence am I getting ready for? Um, in the case of venture capital investment, the IP diligence is often not, is a little lighter. Um, part of the reason is in the early stages when you're getting venture capital investment, you're not going to have as much intellectual property. You're not going to have many patents or many patent applications. Um, and so the focus here is often going to be on the ownership of the IP that you have, and the soundness of your IP policies. The most thorough type of diligence is usually seen when a company is going to acquire an asset of program. Um, for me, I work in the life sciences, so I work with startups that might have a drug in development and a partner is considering acquiring or licensing that drug. And that's where you see the most in-depth diligence. And we'll talk quite a bit about what that entails. Um, then there's the acquisition or a merger. And here the depth of the IP diligence can depend on the maturity of the company being acquired. If it's a fairly mature company, a lot of the issues have been shaken out and are understood, and the IP diligence might not be as in-depth. Um, one of the most important things that I've experienced in an acquisition or merger setting is that the diligence on the IP assets is often initiated fairly late in the deal process. And at the point where the value of the IP has already been priced into the deal and there's a good deal of pressure to close the deal. So while there might not be as in-depth diligence 
you really need to be ready to move very quickly. And in a situation where um, bad news is most unwelcome because everything else has, has really progressed to a, a fairly mature stage. Now, I'm not going to um, go through a list at any point in this, uh, this webinar about all of the things that can be examined and considered in an IEP diligence. Um, there's all kinds of checklists that you can find that'll give you a sense of that. And, but just to give you a feeling for it, it goes way beyond the ownership of IP, the validity of the IP, freedom to operate. It can look into antitrust implications of patent ownership in the EU, um, license agreements that might raise patent misuse concerns, really almost anything surrounding intellectual property of any type anywhere in the world. Um, and it would be, you know, a multi-hour seminar to really go through all of those issues and we're not going to do that. But if I can have the next slide, I just want to briefly talk a little bit about considerations on the sell side versus um, the buy side. And normally, of course, a startup is going to be in the sell side, but not always. Um, just at a high level, when a startup is on the sell side, you need to think about whether the buy side is a competitor or not. Are they working in a very, very similar field to the field you're working in? So if you're developing a drug, hitting a particular type of target for a particular indication, um, there's going to be much more confidentiality concerns and sharper confidentiality concerns with a competitor that's working um, on the same target and for the same indication. Do you have IP that's going to cover the product? If you're at an early stage and don't really have that IP yet, the diligence is not going to be as extensive or as time consuming. And you need to consider whether the buy side is highly knowledgeable in your specific technology and your competitors, as well as the relevance and importance of IP in your field. Um, the buy side isn't always as knowledgeable in these areas as you are, and you need to think about that when diligence is ongoing because you may find it frustrating or mystifying some of the questions they're asking. But if you understand the position where they're coming from, you're going to be much more able to answer their questions at a level that they're going to be comfortable with and is going to be useful to them. And let me just say, really, as a, an overview over all of this, um, whether it's a fairly light level of diligence, like a VC investor might give, or very in-depth diligence that might acquire, occur in an acquisition of an asset, it's all going to be influenced by how important intellectual property is in your field. Um, in some fields, um, particularly in pharmaceuticals, it's incredibly important. Um, any given patent can be enormously valuable. In other areas, you know, one or even half a dozen patents might not be that valuable, but it's the uh, constellation of dozens of patents that cover various aspects of a product that taken together may be valuable. And so that kind of difference is really going to impact how IP diligence goes forward. If you're in a field where there's a 500 patents of um, small value but high collective value, um, you're going to be conducting the diligence and the diligence is going to be conducted on you in a very different way than if there's one or two patents that are really key to the value of the asset. When a startup is performing diligence, it's often on um, an academic, uh, intellectual property coming out of an academic institution as opposed to another commercial entity. And the distinction between the two is, is quite important. Um, academic institutions are generally not going to have done an independent 
patentability or freedom to operate analysis um, for whatever it is that the intellectual property covers. They don't have the budget for that um, and um, just won't be doing that. So you really need to do that yourself. The other thing to think about that's quite important is the tech transfer officers at academic institutions. Um, they're on the sell side of diligence all of the time. They're very experienced at it. Um, they, they know how to do it, um, but they're also working and managing the expectations of professors and other inventors within their institution. And the inventors, the professors can have, you know, somewhat realist, unrealistic expectations that need to be managed by the tech transfer office. So when you're doing a diligence and trying to obtain some IP out of an academic or research institution, you need to be sensitive to that. Um, the tech transfer officers are really trying very hard to work with you and make the process um, as seamless as possible. But not everything and not everyone's expectations are under their control. And you've got to be aware of that and be willing to, to work with that. Another thing to consider, for many startups um, doing some IP diligence so that they can get involved in a relationship, you need to consider what's really important to you. Is it the IP that already exists or that might be created in the future that's important to you? Or is the value really in the collaboration with the other party? And if the value is really in the collaboration going forward, rather than the existing IP, you need to decide how you're going to handle the diligence so that the prospects for successful collaboration are minimized and disputes over the current value and course of the existing IP don't interfere with that, what you hope would be a future fruitful collaboration. And finally, when a startup is performing diligence, you need to think hard about controlling use of your resources. Um, and that's money, of course, expenditure on outside counsel, but also just the bandwidth and energy of the people within the startup. Startups are small. Everybody is wearing multiple hats and you need to spend your resources, your time, your bandwidth intelligently in performing diligence. And what that really means is deciding what matters before you get started. Um, I think I often see people going into diligence without a real plan in mind for what matters, what doesn't matter. And they just keep unearthing issues and trying to deal with them without a real um, developed sense of, is this really an issue that needs to be dealt with? Is this really an issue that could cause a problem down the line? Or is this a small thing that I just shouldn't be spending a lot of resources on? So when you're performing the diligence as a startup, it's particularly important to decide what matters, to decide what you're gonna let go and allocate your resources, financial and time appropriately. If we're going to if we take the next slide, I'm going to talk a bit about the difference between um, a deep dive and um, a, a lighter sort of diligence. So on the light diligence light, really what the focus is going to be on is the overall policies and processes that you have in place at your company. So do you have a written policy? for protecting trade secrets. Have your employees seen that policy, read that policy, and understood that policy? Do you have a process for harvesting invention disclosures? Is there a way that the scientists can bring up and bubble up inventions or potential inventions they've made so that you can make a decision 
in a timely manner about whether it's worth investing resources in developing intellectual property around that idea. And of course, they're not going to ignore your patent applications or your trademarks or your copyrights, but in a diligence light, they're not going to be delving deeply into the validity um, of those patent applications. They're going to be, because it's too early to really have a product, it's too early to have um, real coverage. And so the patent applications are at an early stage of the technology of the company very often when there's this sort of diligence light taking place. So what people are going to be looking for are some of the things that Caleb alluded to. They're going to be looking for solid patent applications. Are these well drafted? Are they directed towards the company's technology? Um, do they, um, or, or are they focused on sort of blue sky things like the flying wrist brace that, that Caleb alluded to? Moving from diligence light to the sort of most in-depth diligence, where we're talking now about a specific product that is really the value in the deal, there's going to be a very, very deep dive on the diligence. They're going to be looking at the patentability of claims covering the product, the breadth of protection around the product so that slight variants or even significant variations can be protected. They're going to be looking at freedom to operate. They're going to be looking at the length of time of the protection. And really importantly, they're going to be looking at product life cycles and the length of the patent protection. The product life cycles and drugs are long. People are going to be looking at patent protection that goes well out into that lengthy product life cycle. They're going to be looking at a plan for regulatory approval and coordination between the regulatory process and the patent process for drugs. It's fairly similar for medical devices. People are going to be looking hard at the length of the product life cycle, the regulatory protection, the patent protection, the interaction between the two of those. Where the product life cycles are faster in certain types of um, consumer products, in software, the length of the patents aren't going to be as important in general because the product life cycle is fast enough that the product will probably move on before the patents expire. There's going to be a deep look at the cost of licenses. Um, when freedom to operate issues arise, um, sometimes the best way to deal with it is to license, if you can, the patent, um, but do that too often and you develop a, a royalty burden that is going to be examined closely and possibly create a, a problem for the acquirer as just having too much of a burden on the, on the pricing of the product or the profits available from the product. And they're going to start looking into manufacturing freedom to operate, um, not just as the product itself free of patents that could raise an issue, but as the entire manufacturing process from end to end free of freedom to operate um, issues. They're going to be looking at the transferability of licenses. Even if the licenses that you have um, don't cost too much, they want to be sure that they can transfer those licenses and take advantage of them after the asset um, that you're offering has been acquired or licensed. If we can take the next slide, I'll be talk about what, you, what a startup can do to be ready for diligence. And there's really just a, a handful of high level things that you can do really from the beginning of the company. And one of them, of course, is to put into place sound IP policies. I spoke about these earlier, an invention disclosure system, a policy for protecting your trade secrets, employment agreements that require assignment of inventions. All of those things are just absolutely essential. They're going to be examined in any diligence. 
any timely assessment of inventorship. And I'm going to speak more in a moment about how important it is to um, have our inventorship be analyzed and correct at an early stage. You want to be sure that there's a chain of title for the patents and patent applications that's clear. Um, people don't want to license or invest in an asset that you don't really own, because if you don't really own it, they can't really acquire it. You're going to want to be able to articulate an IP strategy for your company, and an IP strategy that's suitable for the type of technology that you use. And finally, you're going to want to show that you file patent applications that reflect your innovations and your priorities. Again, this goes back to the issue of not expending excessive effort on blue sky patent applications, but instead things that you're really gonna develop that can really work Maybe sometimes you have things that are really extensive and really what someone else would see is blue sky. It's not blue sky if you're doing it. And you need to have your patent applications reflect what you're doing and what you're looking forward to really being able to do. So if we can take the next slide, we're going to talk about sort of the easiest part um, or something that ought to be easy but often isn't. Um, one of the first things in diligence um, is collecting up documents um, that the other side is going to want to see. And that's a lot easier if you already have um, all of the right documents organized and in the right places and ready at hand so that you can populate the data room. And this sounds easy, um, but it's often very time consuming. So we're talking about things like the copies of patents, copies of patent applications with the filing papers, the executed assignments where the inventors have signed over ownership to the startup, the recordation records to show that those assignments have been um, recorded in the proper patent office, license agreements, employment agreements. And all of this ought to be easy, but it's often very time consuming. Again, startups have limited staff. They've got folks playing multiple roles. Um, we're working with outside IP counsel. I'm just gonna be honest, we send you a lot of documents. We send you a lot of emails um, and it can be very hard to have all of that be organized and ready at hand when you need it. Um, it can make sense sometimes to outsource some of that to your IP counsel. So they're sort of maintaining an in the cloud organized um, set of documents for you that you can readily turn to. And I'll just say one thing about when you actually get to the point of preparing a data room um, for diligence, because there's always going to be a data room. You don't want to overpopulate that data room. You want to stick at least the outset to documents that you won't be worried that anyone is looking at. So you probably want to avoid putting in unpublished patent applications. There's going to be a confidentiality agreement, but you might be working um, on a deal with a fairly close competitor. And in the early stages of the deal, when it's very unclear if the deal is going to be consummated, you don't want them seeing unpublished patent applications. So just be careful about what gets put in the data room. Take a beat look at it, think about whether you really want people to see it at an early stage in, in, the, in the deal process. If we can go to the next slide, I'm going to talk about the reasonably easy part, inventorship and ownership. Um, these are two issues that you really need to attend to in real time. If you don't get the inventorship right when you're filing the patent application, or significantly uh, or, or shortly thereafter. It's the kind of analysis and decision that 
only gets harder as time goes by. And whether the inventorship is correct, whether the ownership is right, whether all the inventors have assigned to the company is going to be looked at in absolutely every diligence. And it's going to be looked at in depth. Um, as I said a moment ago, you can't provide the asset by license or sale if you don't own it in the first place. The other reason that this is looked at in so much depth is quite honestly, it's one of the things that really has a fairly crisp answer. Inventorship determinations can be difficult. Um, there's room for disagreement about who should be an inventor and who shouldn't. But it's a fairly crisp decision. Um, and ownership, whether the assignments are right and the ownership is in the company, that's something that's pretty easy to assess and assess accurately. Other issues like patentability of certain claims, freedom to operate for certain products, that can be much more difficult to get a crisp answer to. It's just natural that parties doing diligence are going to spend a lot of time and energy on the places where they can get a clear answer. And inventorship and ownership is one of those areas. For a startup, inventorship can be very important. A proper analysis done by a lawyer on a claim by claim basis. Often your employees are coming out of an academic institution where they might have done some work in this area before, you want to be sure that the invention was made while they were an employee at your company and they're not bringing inventions over from their academic institution or their previous employer. So that's why all of this part really needs to be in real time and early on. If we can go to the next slide, the harder part is addressing questions about freedom to operate and patentability. Um, these are questions that um, involve essentially considerable resources to, to answer fully and accurately. The buyer is going to do their own assessment every time, um, but you need to do your own assessment. Caleb talked about what happens when you expend a lot of resources on something and find out late in the game that there's a freedom to operate issue. Um, but in diligence, it's even more important because even if something, a freedom to operate question turns out not to be a big issue, not to be a genuine challenge or problem, you want to be the person who knows about those issues first. There aren't any good surprises. The last thing you want is the, um, the entity performing a diligence to come to you and say, hey, did you uh, see this patent application or this patent? And you don't want to say, uh, no, I haven't seen it. Even if there's a great answer to why it's not a problem, you don't want to be surprised. You don't want to have the appearance of not having done your homework on this issue. So when freedom to operate questions arise, it's very important that you don't share um, your opinion about them with the other side of the deal. And as Caleb said, Next, the next talk in this series is going to be about problems with privilege and waiver. And you're going to learn far more about that from my colleagues than you will from me today. But suffice it to say, don't share your opinion, nothing in writing, and any discussion should be between attorneys. Um, you know, when, when, when a freedom to operate issue comes up, sometimes um, it's a patent that is of dubious validity. Sometimes it's a patent application that has wildly broad claims that are highly unlikely to ever be granted. Um, and your lawyer can talk to their lawyer about it. They're not going to share your opinions, but they can tell the other side something that they ought to think about. You know, here's a piece of prior art you might want to take a look at. Or why don't you take a look at column 23 in the patent application and give that some thought? So your 
giving them some guidance without sharing an opinion. And that's a much safer way to approach these kinds of questions when they come up. And they will, they will come up. There's always a patent application out there with, with wild claims that you're going to need to talk about. So you should be prepared and address the questions that come up. Um, if I can take the next slide. Confidentiality and the risk of contamination. Um, confidentiality agreement is a must have. And you need to limit the individuals that have access to your confidential information. Know who they are, know what their role is in the, um, in the other side of the deal. You don't want people that are too closely involved in your technology in the other side of the deal seeing your unpublished patent applications. Um, the Gilead Merck case, you can take a look at this for yourself with a cautionary tale. An entire $800 million verdict against Gilead was wiped out because people who were not supposed to have access to confidential information had some access to it and took advantage of it. If we could take the next slide. So, in sum, on the sell side, be reasonable, be confident. You do not have to say yes to every request. Be aware of information that you cannot provide because protective orders, confidentiality agreements. If you do say no, give a reason for the no and be sure to distinguish no from no, not now. It's too early a stage to share that information. Maybe the later stage we're going to share it. And don't be dismissive of genuine issues. If I can go to the next slide, I'm gonna talk about how briefly, how you build a team that creates value in your IP. Because at the end of the day, that's what the other side is looking for in IP diligence. They want the ownership right, they want the inventorship to be right, they want freedom to operate, but they want IP that has genuine value. So if we go to the next slide. So what makes a good patent? That's my area of concentration, that's Caleb's. It's filed at the right time. Caleb talked about that quite a bit. It contains the right information. Um, when you file too early, you don't have enough data. You don't have enough detail. It provides value by covering the products, um, not industry domination. At the end of the day, you're going to get the most value by covering the product that you're going to make and sell. And very importantly, it tells a story. When a patent is valuable, it will likely be enforced. And when a patent is enforced, judge and a jury need to understand that you faced challenges and you did something great. You want to tell that story. Um, Caleb and I both work a lot with people in our firm who specialize in IP litigation. And not too long ago, I was discussing one of my colleagues in the IP litigation side of patent application. And I was getting drilling down on a really important point of the technology. And they understood the technology, but I really wanted them to get why this was important and mattered a lot to the patentability. And my colleagues said, look, they need to, just, just, I'm just going to stop you right there. This is all great. This is all interesting. But tell me what the invention story is. Because if I'm going to enforce this patent in a litigation, I need to be able to tell a compelling invention story. And, and we'll worry about all that technology detail, but tell me the story first. And I think that's something important to keep in mind. So how do you create this? If we go to the next slide, there's three groups of people involved in creating great IP. And in a startup, this is usually people taken from a pretty small group. There needs to be a lead contact at the startup with the time and interest in intellectual property. A lot of startups don't have an in-house lawyer. Um, so this might be a scientist or business development person. It might be the CEO, might be the CSO, but it has to be somebody with some time and some interest in intellectual property. 
And there's the scientists and engineers, and then there's, of course, your outside IP council. You need good relationships and good communication between these three groups of people. In startups, everyone is busy. Everyone is playing multiple roles. And they need to make time for intellectual property. If you don't have good working relationships, the scientists and engineers are going to see the intellectual property as a distraction from their real job, which is making a great product. And you need it to not be a distraction. You need to be respectful of their time and respectful of the work that they do. And that can only be done by building these relationships. I think like a lot of you, you've been a lot of you, I've been following the Web Space Telescope the last few days. I was reading about the program manager that took over about five years ago um, when the project was way behind and really turned the project around. And I was interested in reading his profile. Um, Gregory Robinson is his name. And he wasn't a high level project manager at NASA, at least the article I read didn't seem to indicate that he was. And I sort of wondered. Why him and why was he so successful in turning the project around? And the profile of, of Mr. Robinson said that his real skill was building trusting relationships, that he knew how to do that, and that's what turned the project around. And that's key to developing good IP. Um, your outside counsel needs to have a deep understanding of your technology, your products not just a good understanding of the general technology field. Any good lawyer can write a good patent application in their technical field, whether it's antibodies or transluminal catheters. But a good antibody application, a good transluminal catheter application isn't good enough. You need to have a patent application that's about your antibody, your transluminal catheter that takes into account the goals and challenges that your company faced in developing that product. And only by having that deep understanding and close relationship with the scientists and the engineers can your outside counsel achieve that for you. So those are my thoughts on how you build a team in a startup that can build the intellectual property that can survive a diligence. Um, I know we have a couple of minutes left, and Caleb and I would be happy to take some um, some questions. Otherwise, we'll wrap up and let you have the rest of your day back. Okay, thank you, everyone. <laughs>